Yeah, that's worked. Brilliant. Okay, so in terms of uh, agenda, um, just a bit of context, uh, sort of the historical context to the project and some, uh, for want of better terminology, systemic or institutional type context. Just to run through really what is we're trying to achieve, what our objectives are with, with CICC as we refer to it, and you know, falling out of that, the benefits that we see of of chasing this particular uh, project down. Um, want to hone in on some of the challenges, um, and there really have been some challenges with with this. Um, but I've got to say, um, whilst there are challenges, um, they've been a really, really useful learning experience. And I hope something um, that the learning from that, you know, we can take forward with maybe could doing these types of projects again in the future. Um, the timeline, the proposed timeline in terms of delivery and then a summary and some questions and answers. Although I've put the QA thing at the end there, please feel free to put your hand up throughout. Um, now, what I cannot do uh, with this, and I hope you appreciate this, is I cannot go into, um, because of the stage we're at in, in the, the project, any of the sort of detail on money and, and things like that because of the commercial sensitivities and, and, and things like that. Um, but I'll say that it's not insignificant, um, which is good, some investment context. So from, I suppose, contextually from an MOD point of view, you know, Catra Garrison is long established. It's, it is, I think, still the largest garrison for us in, in Europe. Um, it's serving a population at risk of uniform personnel, personnel about 17,000 personnel. And the, that comprised various units, infantry, including Gurkha. There's various combat support and combat service support elements there. We also have a very significant infantry training centre in Catrick uh, Garrison, and that includes P Company uh, from the parachute regiment in that those the selection process uh, for those going into the more elite side of, of the armed forces, such as the parachute regiment. Um, we, the probably the most significant uh, issue we, we've had from an MOD perspective is a massive infrastructure failure in the past. Um, uh, what was the Duchess of Kent military hospital, we were sharing that with uh, elements of NHS primary care and that had a major uh, infrastructure failure which uh, led us to develop some temporary short-term measures, i.e. we grabbed a couple of barrack blocks and uh, converted them into medical facilities to, to serve the population. And similarly, the NHS practice had to find a, alternate uh, accommodation there. Um, and it wasn't just, uh, you know, uh, unique to medical, it was also dental as as well. Um, well I was jumped a bit too far there. Um, Another important contextual element of this has been uh, this world of transformation and healthcare transformation. It seems that every part of health is doing some kind of transformation at present. Um, for, of course, from an NHS perspective, uh, more recently, it's been the shift from CCGs to you know, integrated care boards. For ourselves and DMS, it's been about what we term the health improvement programme, where we look at you know, improving deployability, as we refer to it. The various workforce challenges, what we call grouping. So how do we create sort of primary healthcare hubs around the uh, force lay down across the country? We've also had transformation in the estate side, what they call defence estate rationalisation. So looking at the entirety of the defence estate, you know, what do we need? What could we maybe hand off or, or sell off, you know, for that matter, uh, and what needs improving, um, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, you know, from the perspective of, I suppose, um, both uh, entities, sorry, the IT is filling me here, um, the, you know, dealing with the realities of, of the healthcare uh, landscape, in particular workforce, you know, that um, work, you know, the workforce shortfalls that we're all aware about. It's not just a UK thing. It's not just a European thing. It, it is a worldwide um, situation with respect to certain um, specialities. So this all trying to, all of this happening in the context of all that transformation. 
From an NHS perspective and our colleagues in, in the ICB in, in North in Humber and North Yorkshire, um, they're faced with sort of delivering uh, of primary care and other healthcare services to an armed forces, uh, but also a local, rural and agrarian type community. Beautiful Yorkshire. I don't know if you've you've ever visited that wonderful place. But it is a very rural and and sometimes quite austere um, area, and and of course delivering healthcare in that kind of environment comes with its challenges. Um, specifically uh, in the Garrison area or Catrick Town area, the NHS serve a population at risk of circa thirty five thousand people, um, give or take. And again, uh, as mentioned, they were sort of impacted by uh, this uh, infrastructure failure of the Duchess of Kent uh, Hospital and, and in very short order, like ourselves, had to come up with an alternative to keep providing primary care to the, the population up there. Um, don't know if you know it, but Yorkshire is one of those areas, one, one of those parts of the country where there are quite um, stark or significant uh, wealth inequalities. And, and all the things, including health inequalities that come along uh, with that. And, you know, people like the uh, the councils in the area, uh, be that local level councils or the um, more county level um, uh, councils have long identified a need to really uh, get after this and, and deal with the various um, issues that fall out of the, the wealth inequalities up there. And similarly, um, various issues up there with respect to access and access to various um, services where there's a, a perception or a feeling that those people in say, uh, more built up areas within Yorkshire probably get better access to some service than maybe some of the rural, rural um, population. There's just some, some stuff there from the ICB in terms of um, the, the sort of the demographic up there. 70.6% of the population live in the rural areas, 30% um, live in Catterick Town itself. There's a military population including veterans, forces, families and so-called camp followers and their health needs are characterised by obesity, drug and alcohol abuse, smoking, risky behaviours, chaotic lifestyles, lifestyle choices, homeliness, homelessness, it has the highest rate in North Yorkshire, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So quite a significant challenge for the ICB in terms of meeting the health needs of, of the population there. Um, and I would add to that as well, you know, it's a transient um, community um in in many ways um you know, because of just the way the military work um and it's not just the service person um that often gets get sort of upheaved and and moved on it's the family it's you know that that tend to go along with it uh, you know as well so uh, you know quite important context there from from the care board's point of view in terms of getting after the issue, uh, this is a nice graphic sort of produced by the, the ICB in that, you know, there was this hospital up there, the Duchess of Kent Hospital, um, initially a, a more general uh, hospital delivering secondary health care to the armed forces population. Uh, we had Defence Custody 15 in the 90s, which sort of scrubbed that and then refocused its attention more on delivery of mental health, but also drawing in elements of local primary care to utilise the, the infrastructure there. Um, moving through various steps in its, its life cycle leading up to, I think it was in 2015, this, this failure of the infrastructure I've referred to. So in terms of objectives and what we want to achieve by CICC. So we've long had ambitions for a world first joint NHS and MOD healthcare facility to serve the garrison and the town. I say it's a world first because we're talking about truly being integrated. We've been down the road of doing joint ventures um, with our NHS colleagues in the past. But what we've tended to do is just build a facility and occupy it and almost like run it like two separate practices. 
you know, the moment we enter the place, we just go off and do our own thing. We build up these Chinese walls. We've done it in locations like Aldershot, uh, Lark Hill, um, you know, fabulous facilities, really great infrastructure, but we haven't sort of taken integration further and really worked together. The aim is to support military personnel, their families, um, and the existing and growing aging population in the Richmondshire area. Provide a person and family centred holistic care that meets the needs of the whole population uh, in, in the area and adjust the challenges uh, with current facilities and estates. Referring there again, like I said before, about tackling um, inequalities and recognising the special needs of the population. In, in terms of benefit, well, I suppose the obvious one is infrastructure. Um, you know, we're both sitting with temporary solutions after what happened in 2015, and, and we're looking at having a brand new facility built um, for that purpose. Not only is a new facility, but we're both signed up to the uh, various uh, departments net zero agendas of course very very important today uh, but that is front and center of um, what we want to achieve and it is about serving the whole population and um, moving away from dealing with or serving um, the population but in their subsets so the service personnel tend to get seen by the uniformed primary care people, families and veterans seen by by the, the NHS and, and the paths never really cross really. And, you know, ignoring the obvious of, well, actually this whole thing's interlinked and the health of serving personnel, by way of example, is impacted by, in some way, shape or form, the health of their family and vice versa. There's also the issue of workforce, um, you know, that, you know, we are both sitting with our distinct sort of workforce elements. Is there a better way to use and exploit that and 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 um, maybe take on some of the shortfalls in different ways by by integrating our workforce to an extent? I think a really important one is clinical practice. How do we learn from each other and the mutual benefits. So here we are in the military sitting with our population where it's mostly acute um, issues, musculoskeletal for instance, um, and with a healthcare provision package that's sort of built around that very much about rehabilitation, occupational medicine, that kind of thing. Is there something maybe our NHS colleagues can learn from in that sense? At the very least, if you know, things like social prescribing. Um, you know, can we use um, some aspects of the way we deliver to our force to benefit the NHS population and of course vice versa, you know, what can we do in terms of learning more about chronic disease management, social prescribing, um, reaching into social care elements, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so many opportunities we hope when it comes to um, clinical practice. Um, economies of scale is one that sort of chucked around a, a, an awful lot. Uh, I suppose that yes, uh, that potentially there there are, especially when it comes to maybe sort of back room or back office type type thing. You know, why duplicate when maybe we can sort of come up with a uh, an integrated approach in 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 that sense. Um, but I've got to say that. Um, <laughs> I'm 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 really cautious of that when that word <laughs> economy or efficiency is chucked in there. Um, you know, uh, I think sometimes when we focus, or sometimes when transformation is driven or appears to be driven by efficiencies, um, we lose the message here, and 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 maybe um, the message about the overarching aim. This is about you know serving our population better medically and, and coming together to do so. And then obviously, um, I, you know, the integration of all elements where we can um, and a stress where we can and it about it being a journey. And this is a very important point because 
when hopefully we open the doors of CICC in a uh, quarter of four of 2024, it may not look very integrated, you know, at day one. Um, we have identified a whole series of pilots that we will look to start undertaking integration on and, and working together hand in hand on. Um, but there are so many challenges in, in doing that. But at the very least, what we're going to do is open those doors with a roadmap in place for integration and how we're going to take this forward over a, say, a five year period. Come on, IT. Yes. Um, there'll be various services delivered from CICC, um, obviously primary medical care, but we're also looking at the likes of physio and rehab, diagnostics such as um, uh, ultrasound, x-ray, um, mental health, including CAMS, some secondary care out outreach in, in the form of pain management and orthopedics, uh, various uh, substance misuse services, um, social prescribing, and as I say, uh, from our perspective, occupational medicine. Now, I mentioned the challenges. Um, so this has been all about sort of making it a reality, I think, for, for the team. Way back in 2015, when faced with the infrastructure challenge, we had some really courageous people on both sides who said, how, how can we do this differently? We've both been impacted by, by what has gone on here. How do we take this forward to, together and support the community better? And of course, all of that in the context of what had, was been happening and, and the trans, transformation going on in, in the NHS. Moving from PCTs to uh, CCGs, now to ICBs and all the changes associated with that. Um, and through there, I've got to say their tenacity, their forethought, um, they they have really started to make it a reality to the point where um, two years ago, a outline business case was submitted to both organisations, the, uh, the then the CCG and, and, and ourselves, and we gained the monies to do the initial planning work and onboard a contractor to assist us with it planning and, and design stuff. And we are bringing that work to fruition now. Uh, we're going out to market, testing the various work packages associated with the build uh, and both looking to submit our full business cases in um, January of next year, uh, fingers crossed. Um, that you know, takes me on to the business case process uh, and the challenges of that. Um, we all have our own way of approaching this, um, but it's one of the, I think we fell foul of one of the classics in business cases in, in that um, when you submit the likes of your outline business case and your estimate of what this um, may cost, uh, everybody takes that as given, that's hard as stone. This was going to cost X type thing. And of course that starts worming, it, worming itself into people's budget forecasts and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden you're hit with the reality when you start to test some of these costs with market. And uh, uh, needless to say, um, the actual um, um, estimate that came back with testing for market was significantly more than was originally put in the, the original business case. And of course that just sets everyone panicking. And oh my God, um, I think, um, that has been a particular issue for, I, I think, our NHS colleagues and ICB colleagues. And it's been fascinating in a way, um, watching this play out from, from an external perspective, because one of the things it's highlighted, for instance, is just really the really dire state of, of uh, infrastructure uh, planning and money for primary care out there. Um, you know, much of the uh, NHS England's uh, infrastructure plan um, that was published not that long ago, um, you know, very much hinges around secondary care and provision of hospitals and building hospitals. And so little of that seems to be in the social care and primary care space. Um, and I've got to say the budgets and the money available out there for this kind of stuff 
tends to reflect that. It, it, for me, and a stress, it, it, it's me and, and a perception. It very much Cinderella service like in, in a way, and that's been a huge challenge for the RICB colleagues to try and secure the monies to to feed this project. Um, but it really has been a a case of Rob P Peter to pay Paul, and um, I've got to say very little assistance from up top. You know, uh, very there just seemed to be nothing in a way for them to be able to tap into at, at central level at NHS Inc level to to draw down the funding. Um, it's been a huge challenge for ICB colleagues, and and well done to them to you know for getting it to the place where where it's been got to right now and the cost side as well i think it's worth noting the the obvious impact of the current inflationary pressures and that i I've, I've put here lack of contingency that's not entirely true there is contingency but of course the i suppose the the extent to which or the 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 actual rate of of inflation uh, pressures, be that in terms of fuel, be that in terms of um, things like steel, be that uh, workforce uh, inflationary pressures. Um, you know, it's just blown those contingencies out of the water. It really has. And it is it is a huge concern, uh, I've got to say, um, you know, for our project, but I, I can't imagine that what it's been like for bigger projects. You know, just the, the impact of, of of, of inflation on these cost estimates and, and delivering these kind of bills. Um, I mentioned a bit about the, the budgetary environment already when it comes to infrastructure. Um, I know we have our own pressures internally in the MOD, but I, I've got to say they pale in insignificance to those kind of pressures that, that as I mentioned, primary care are, um, are, um, are facing these days. And there are obvious sort of policy and, and legal um, issues when it comes to if infrastructure, um, even when you're just doing it by yourself as a, as a separate department, but actually bringing those together, it can be <laughs> quite phenomenal. Again, another massive learning area for me is that, you know, it's really drawn out the various structures and entities that are out there when it comes to delivering primary care in the NHS. And we we all tend to talk about it as as a single thing, but of course it's not. You know, this part of primary care is owned by such and such. This part is owned by another entity, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result, you end up with a being confronted with a whole lot of policy and leasing type issues and and et cetera, et cetera. Um, as a result, and I've got to say, our colleagues in NHS property, property services have been phenomenal in supporting us in this end because of their understanding and, and their experience of delivering in in primary care in in the past. And I've got to say, it, it has been a, a challenge. In terms of challenges and integration, um, well, first things first, I suppose the question that we be we were confronted with initially was well what does integration look like it's a very easy term to use um but what does it actually look like in in this case is it something similar to say done in in Aldershot or or Lark Hill or or something uh more and of course for us uh and and our objective it it has to be so much more but actually putting what integration looks like down on paper is is a very difficult task and getting into the level of detail of what integration looks like um, is a difficult task. Um, another observation is that there is no such thing as pre quo po. There just isn't. Um, when you have lines of demarcation, uh, be that at a department, department level, you are the Department of Health, you are the Ministry of Defence, um, that creates a, a barrier of, of sorts. Working all the way down, to the local level uh, where things like budgets, different policies, different structures, different owners of different services, workforces, contracts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there, is, there is no such thing as quid pro quo. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, um, it, from 
my clinical colleagues perspective locally um i think they had a vision of of it being a more sort of quid pro quo type arrangement but of course the realities of policy legalities et cetera, et cetera, prevent you from from doing that um and i've i've often um had to disappoint them unfortunately um to say no sorry we can't do it that way um I've mentioned many of the integration barriers uh, or what can be seen to be integration barriers. We all have our own distinct policies, distinct budgets, structures, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes they can be seen as, as, as a barrier to integration. And the challenge I think for us has been is, is asking ourselves, well, actually, what is our task here? Do we have to fuse these things? Do we have to create vehicles which allows uh, allow us to say cross the seams of different policies or budgets, et cetera, et cetera? Um, or do we actually create new ones? You know, um, d d does this approach, uh, does integration require a, a whole new set of 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 policies uh, and the likes? I've all already mentioned complexities such as as leasing um there are cultures um you know we we have clinical cultures we have administrative cultures we have an mod culture we have an nhs culture and um that in itself can can present some some challenges i've got to say um i think my experience on this one has been um, those cultures have been less of an issue on the clinical side. I've got to say uh, it's been more on the sort of business side of of things. Um, you know, when we're trying to get over some of say, these leasing issues or legal issues and everything else, more often than not, the first response is, oh, well, we don't do it that way. Yeah, we, have, well, we, we, we know. But actually, we're doing something quite different here, and and maybe we need to come up with something new. Type, or oh, can't you know can't do that, you know, type thing, and and uh, you know, and it's been quite um, frustrating, I think, for our our clinical partners in in this to see some of these arguments play out in the background, um, because I think their view is, well, hang on, it all come the money all comes from the same pot. It's still number eleven Downing Street type thing, but again. The world just doesn't work that way, and and we all have to um, operate in you know along our own policy lines and 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 everything else. And again, I mentioned earlier about um, a sort of you know transformation. I think one of the worrying things for me has been is is uh, this issue about efficiencies and and transformation driven by efficiencies and this sort of Taylor esque scientific management type uh, perception um, or, or approach, if I dare say that, um, you lose so much when, you, you know, uh, in terms of messaging, in terms of getting people behind your vision, um, when it all seems to be about efficiencies. And that's absolutely not what CICC is about. Um, but the, our wider transformation activity it has certainly been about efficiencies, be they workforce efficiencies or others. And it, very, very quickly, uh, CICCC and the perception of CICC got sort of pulled into that. And more often than not, when you mention CICC to people and, and the workforce and particularly the people affected about it, they will come back immediately with workforce efficiencies. It's about cutting positions or, or whatever else when it's not it's absolutely not um so it, it's one of those things i think it's on a daily basis on my ra radar and 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 trying to constantly push a positive message when it comes to CICC and what it is we're trying to achieve. No, it's not about efficiencies per se. It's about doing this better and serving our population better. Other challenges has been, I don't know if you're aware, but the local MP for Richmondshire in that area, where it was the um, former chancellor and and uh, former runner for the the uh, the leadership. Um, but I've got to say, um, his offers have been hugely supportive, massively supportive, and and pushing out pieces like this in in the local press, um, which um, has been very very helpful, and I've overnight now i feel i've lost my leverage really in this sense 
<laughs> because um, there was a possibility that, um, you know, that the it could have been the leader of the Conservative Party and the Prime Minister. And what leverage could that, would that have been when it came to securing money at the end of the day? Um, there's also a lot of local attention as well, media wise, and which is, is a bit of a challenge. Um, the area that we are building it has a very heavy association with Baden Powell uh, and uh, for his former sort of headquarters in, in the garrison. Um, and unfortunately, one of those buildings has to be demolished. Um, as part of this, um, and that has gone into um, the council for for as part of the planning application, and you know, understandably, some local elements, uh, you know, hold this very dear to their heart and that association uh, close, and have honed in on that. And we have a constant drumbeat on social media of of attention, um, and 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 what we plan to do. In in this sense, which is is a challenge, and I, I've got to say, both our media teams have have to deal with this on on a daily basis. In terms of timeline, I mentioned quarter four over here. Uh, sorry, quarter three in in twenty twenty four. That's our aiming point to have the doors open, but there are a lot of stages in between there. Uh, probably uh, the, the well, the next uh, major decision point for us is the result of the planning application um, in in Yorkshire, and then uh, for ourselves. Uh, in MOD, but also the NHS, the next decision points are the submissions of the full business case and securing the monies. And hopefully, if that's successful, moving into the contract um, action phase of securing uh, who is going to build the facility for us. Oh, go backwards. No, no. There we go. Um, so in terms of summary, it, it is a unique joint pathfinding project for MOD and um, the NHS. Um, I tend to refer to it as an integration journey. It really is a journey. As I say, on day one, when we open these doors, we are going to be opening those doors with a roadmap for integration and how we do this better, how we best exploit each other's capabilities to deliver to this needy population. And it is a needy population in health terms and social terms. It seeks to serve the whole of the population in the garrison and surrounding area, not just hone in on subsets of the population, the whole population. It will hopefully improve access to services on both sides um, be that serving personnel or um, this the population that the NHS normally serves. And as I mentioned, it will exploit elements of service of mutual benefit. I mentioned occupational medicine, rehab, um, uh, substance misuse services, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, a really, really uh, important aim there in terms of exploiting what we already have. And it will hopefully serve as a template um, for the future. Um, my boss said to me not that long ago, said, Paddy, you're probably never going to touch something like this again uh, or want to touch something like this again because of all the challenges. Absolutely not. It's a pathfinding project. And I really do hope that this serves as a template for the future and that all those niggles, heartaches and everything else that we, and in particular my counterpart in NHS Property Services, Karina, have experienced that that will be sitting on the, the you know the shelf for you know our colleagues in the future that if we choose to do this again and 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 or should i say when we choose to do this again um in serving um our populations that those templates are there those learnings are there in, in terms of taking it forward and i'll leave it there uh, yeah in terms of questions and answers and if i may i'll just do a quick plug on, you see on the screen there um, a quick gra a graphic there for the Zero Suicide Alliance. Um, bumped into the team uh, at NHS Confed this year. Uh, what a super bunch of people. Uh, I don't know if you've had contact with the organisation, but they do provide um, training in 
uh, suicide awareness uh, and, and the likes to various populations. There's lots of free training and free resources on 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 their website. So uh, apologies, but a really quick plug for for a fabulous bunch of people and a brilliant organization, um, uh, the Zero Suicide Alliance. Folks, I'll leave it there. Now, how do I stop sharing? <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you, Paddy. Um, so has anybody got any questions for Paddy at all? That was a very, very comprehensive uh, take through of what you've been up to. And uh, just while you were on it, I couldn't resist. I put the Catterick Garrison up on Google Maps. Yeah. Look at the scope and scale of the. I mean, it's enormous, isn't it? it is. Yeah. It's a big old place there. So uh, it is. It's a fabulous place. But of course, it, it's one of those classics, John, isn't it? When you see this beautiful countryside, you know, and everything else, and and you see certain parts of the area like Richmond and everything else, it looks so opulent and everything else. It's hiding so much in health terms. It hides so much. Yeah, and it's not unlike uh, you know elsewhere. So you go you know, go down to Aldershot, you know, near the Surrey Hills and so on, uh, near Camberley and that kind of thing, Guildford, and again, you know, high levels of uh, deprivation. Yeah. Uh, financially and and from a sort of everyday well-being perspective so i think we've got uh, a few questions for you so i'll let you go do okay? so the first one apologies i'm doing it as it appears on my screen so david you have your hand up great to see you david yeah hi paddy thanks for that um yeah i'm in um Lancaster campus, University of Cumbria today, which is the reason why I'm dressed and I'm not in my pyjamas, which I uh, <laughs> normally am. Um, but the reason why I say that is because um, we're here for the Defence Medical Leadership Programme yes. today and tomorrow. Um, we've got Peter Hover here and uh, we had Jim Hockenall talking to us uh, oh, this morning from uh, Stratcom uh, HQ. Um, but we also had um, Chris Hopson, who's um, chief strategy uh, Ch chief strategic officer for nhs england used to be nhs providers chief exec mm. um who took us through the um uh, the, the the nhs long-term plan yeah. which was interesting but um even though he kept talking about um transformation there's no transformation in there at all and it's rather like some of the um aspects of the program that you're running at the moment we talk about transformation but we don't really mean it uh, most of the time it's yeah. transactional uh, change that we're <laughs> making i made a note of where you was talking about the pcts turning into ccgs and now icbs you know that to me is not transformation transformation is rather like maneuver it's an attitude it's a uh, um yes mm. it, 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 it's it, it's a um it, it's a cognitive thing rather than a physical thing and i think the problem with these change programs is we always get fixed on the tangible we always get fixed on the outputs we always get fixed as you say on the efficiencies mm. we always get and then we forget that the main thing that people and patients want is access to services yeah and, yeah. and 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 that's what we do well in the military when we're campaign planning of course is we identify the impact we identify the end state and the effects mm. and work back and so that we can work towards that and i think there's a danger in all of these programs and plans that we're, we're going to miss we're going to miss that key uh, measurable which is the um it, it, which is the access to services so yeah, people need. yeah. It doesn't matter whether you're a soldier, sailor, airman, civilian, um, you know, veteran, families, everybody wants the same thing. It's all about access. I, I think very, very valid observations, David. And, and you know, don't start me on, on transformation. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think we, we, we said we, we seem to spend so much time creating the illusion of transformation than actually transforming. And, you know, sometimes maybe we should stop and and um, look at things uh, by way of example, you know, Le Leeds improvement method, method and, and what, what they managed to achieve in, in Leeds with real transformation, ground based, um, top level facilitated transformation. Um, but I think very, very valid. Um, points and I think you know absolutely access is is one of the key things absolutely key things for for both our parties you know in in this venture 
Now, who is next on my my limited screen? I've got someone here that just says Chairman Codford VH. Apologies. <laughs> oh, that, that's that's one of my many identities, Paddy. It's John McIntosh here. It's John. So no, the that, devil. That, I didn't realise it had come up on the Codford Village Hall team site. I didn't recognise you with the beard. That, that shows you the wonders of doing everything on the uh, uh, on the same computer. Um, so so I'm I'm particularly interested looking at the size and scale of the graphics of the building that's being shown. It looks bloody enormous. Yeah. It, it, it looks as big as as the DKMH was in its yes. day. Yeah. So. So I'm, I'm I'm interested in exactly what's in it. Have have they are the NHS closing down GP practices across the area, or will they still exist? And have you got di you know have you got community diagnostics outreach? Is that what's filling it up? It's it Indeed. still looks really big for the population concerned. It is uh, absolutely so. So the, the the list that I drew up there of services is 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 not an exhaustive list. Um, yes, the main practice, the Harewood practice, it will be the the dominant one on on the NHS side there. But then so many other services, be be they primary care based or tertiary type services, and as I mentioned, with a bit of secondary healthcare outreach in there uh, as well. Um, another factor as well is we're on the military side, we currently have two separate uh, practices. We have our, our garrison medical practice, but we also have our uh, infantry training centre practice separately over at the ITC itself. They will be, be brought together um, as well as sort of the, the various dental entities. And I say various as well, <laughs> dotted around. So um, it, it is it is vast, absolutely, but it is going to be packed with so many things. And I should mention as well, on like you say, on on the social pres prescribing side as well, um, there will be um, opportunities there to bring more bodies and entities. And I think it. it one of the reasons, um, and I, I sh don't have any better drawings with me, but um, what isn't you don't get a feel for in those drawings it, it, is there's a real feel of space in there as well. Um, so that long line across the sort of the top of the building is is very much an open space, uh, and is seen as being a community space. Um, and less about sort of the actual delivery of healthcare per se, and more about being a community uh, and various groups such as um, families groups and, and everything else can utilise that space as well. So it, it it does absolutely look very very big, but I I'm, I assure you we will occupy it. <laughs> well, if if you've got so much in there from the two different communities. Is the funding split on it a point of tension or has that actually been easy to understand and take you through the pathway mm. going through it? Because it has all, been. You know, yeah. you know, you mentioned it all comes from number 11 Downing Street, mm -hmm. but actually it's not owned by the local no. providers at all. It's, no. it's in much bigger buckets. So yeah. It has it has been a tension of sorts, I have to say. Um, but actually, what's been really helpful is the uh, the so the ICB have been really straight with us and the SRO and the ICB and say, look, our money's capped. There is no more money. Um, you know, and we're all like I said, we're already robbing Peter to pay Paul to to provide you with this sum type thing. So we can chuck, um, you know. Uh, uh, you know proportions at them um, and and occupancy percentages and 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 everything else. It doesn't change the fact that their money's capped. So uh, that's been quite useful in a way as a lever for us with UK Stratcom uh, to say that you know fine yeah you know you you can go at these ratios all you like but this is it this is the reality of the situation and what what this ICB is facing. Um, so yeah, there have been tensions, um, but not necessarily between us on the delivery side of the project, um, more at that higher level uh, in terms of who is sourcing the money at the end of the day. That's interesting, thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. So next I have Sam. 
Thanks, Paddy, and a great presentation. Thanks for that. Um, just from the user, the service user side. Yeah. Have you have you been able to engage with them? Are they yeah. bought into this? Absolutely. Are you doing elements of it in you know pure co-production, or you're not quite there yet? Yeah, absolutely. From the outset, it's one thing a real a positive learning thing for us on the MOD side of just how the ICB then in a CCG approach this, they've engaged the community from the outset because of course they were hugely let down um, by, by this infrastructure failure. We on the MOD, we were lucky to have this big machine called the Defence Infrastructure Organisation who could jump in really quickly and create this temporary accommodation and everything else. Poor Harewood Practice had a very different and diff more difficult journey in that, in, in that sense. And of course the obvious impact were on to the community that were delivering um, so they've been engaged from the outset and, um, you know, even down to the point where, you know, our contractor who's been involved in the design uh, element of that, we've insisted on them having a specific comms and community engagement uh, team um, and who are constantly going out there, uh, constantly holding in information days. Um, now, I'm not hiding from the, the from the fact that you know part of that has been self-serving in in terms of maybe taking on some of the protectionism over the Baden Powell building and you know and, and everything else and um, and getting our version of that message out there. But by and large, it has been driven by by the needs and and the communication we have had with the with the local community. I was going to say, and I I, I currently work for the NHS, but have in an, an integrated role that I had previously, working um, with the local authorities and the CCGs that are now the ICBs. Mm. Um, it is tricky because the different organisations are yeah. big and they've <laughs> got their own way of doing things. So Absolutely. I, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. It, it, you know, it, it's one of those things, uh, and I say this all the time to my colleagues, and you know, everybody refers to the NHS, and you say, no, there's no such thing anymore, really. Um, it's, yeah, no, really, really important point, Sam. Thank you. No, thank you. And then I have Emma. I think I was going to be saying very much the same as Sam was. Um, <laughs> I've also come from a, a, an NHS background. I work for the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Kings Lynn and we are currently doing some Yay. small. I'm glad John likes that idea. Of, I used to be at Marham. Um, oh, did you? We worked yeah. very closely with Marham. Uh, so it, it's really Actually, nice. Uh, to... I've just I've just written to Laura uh, uh, and uh, and Joe uh, asking them to renew you guys as members. So uh, if you do see Laura about or hmm. Joe Humphreys, do go and say hi and say um, you were on a call with us and you'd much appreciate your membership being paid next year. Oh. Thank you very much. Oh, I, I, will, I will drop them a line and say it's come from <laughs> you, not from me, okay? Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was very much the same sort of thing, but I was thinking about, um, you talked about how you'd engaged with members of your community from a, an NHS perspective. Did you engage with military personnel as well to find out what they wanted? Because that could be, a little yeah. bit different to what yeah. to what the local community wants and also how have you in sorry two questions how have you incorporated my favorite topic or the favorite topic at our hospital which is transport and car parking because if you're <laughs> if you're <laughs> moving a building to be more yeah. centralized it's a real issue especially in a in a deprived area which we are as well in west norfolk so so two things there so um engaging so the in terms of engaging our community, so in a way, there are sort of two lines of engagement there. There's the engagement with the chain of command in terms of what they require for the force um, and uh, in an occupational and operational sense. And then the force itself, those those members serving all the time. And we are constantly engaging. Um, there are the sort of obvious ones um in, in, in you know related to uh, mental health musculoskeletal uh, that kind of thing there are other sort of maybe less all of uh, more um sort of more culturally 
uh, determined ones, like for instance the, the Gurkha population, um, are there, and, that, and that's been a long-standing thing. I've got to say, uh, with the regional headquarters up there, very, very in tune of of the health needs of of the force up there from a chain of command and from a serving person's perspective, and the people around that serving person. On the car parking and access bit, a massive amount of detail. Um, causes me real headaches at one point because of all the counter-terrorism measures that come with it because it's a primarily an MOD facility, owned facility. Um, but very much tied into the local council as well, though, um, in, in terms of bus services, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But very much an, an active work strand in, in the whole project. Apologies, I can't go into more detail, Emma, because we're right up against it on the, on the time. Wise. No, that's absolutely fine. It's just it's a real issue for us as well. And yeah. um, we've got a lot of change going on at the hospital, and a lot of building work at the hospital. And we're about to announce a new multi-storey car park design at the hospital, which will be quite interesting <laughs> as Norfolk is so flat to see something as big as a multi-storey car park there, on the horizon. There is one hill in Norfolk and Morham's on the top of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> John, thank apologies. You, it's you. right on 1300. Oh, that's fabulous, Paddy. It's the only time anybody speaks in military timing when I'm with you. It's uh, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> just delightful, just delightful. Well, everybody, I do hope you enjoyed that. Paddy is such a font of knowledge and uh, we're very grateful to you, Paddy, for putting in so much effort to prepare that presentation. Uh, I just think this is watch this space. I mean, it's just like for me, it's a microcosm of what's mm -hmm. going on in any sort of ICS area or ICB area. Yeah. You know, what you have to do to create an integrated service for military personnel around a garrison such as Catrick or elsewhere. I just think it's uh, it's the sort of thing that it, it's a micro version of what we're trying to plan elsewhere. So if we yeah. can, then we should. But thank you very much indeed. We're most grateful to you. Emma, do go and have a word with Laura and Joe and put in your, your plea uh, for them to renew with us. That would be fantastic. For the rest of you, thanks so much for joining in today. Do please make sure that you've got our national conference in your diaries. That takes place, I think, the 11th of November. I think that's right. Jade will tell me off immediately if that's not correct. <laughs> uh, but we're looking forward to that. And if you'd like to contribute at all, any of you, to uh, an, an article for our forthcoming next issue of In The Loop, which is our in-house magazine for IHSCM members. Do please contribute. It doesn't matter what the topic is. If it's military, that's fine. But any topic you like, we'd love to have it. Our next issue goes out on October the 1st. So you've got a little bit of time to uh, give some thoughts to it. But for today, Paddy, we're in your debt once again. Thank you very much. And for the rest of you, Hope you enjoy the rest of your week. Oh, it's the 10th of November. There you go. Don't come on the 11th. <laughs> You'll be a day late. 10th of November. We will see you there. Thanks very Thank much, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. Have a great day. Bye-bye.